Hello everyone and welcome again to another SCJ Marketing Think Tank webinar. Um, today we're going to be talking about an interesting topic. We're going to talk about nostalgia and why nostalgia works so well in marketing with Kelsey Jones today. And I think it's going to be a pretty interesting presentation. Um, uh, I, I got a chance to, you know, I always get a chance to kind of see these ahead of time. And so uh, there was a couple notes that I definitely took from it. So um, interesting uh, discussion point. Um, before we jump in uh, and get started, um, my name is Brent Satoris. I'm going to be the moderator. I'm going to let Kelsey do a little introduction for herself, and then we'll get into some housekeeping items. Uh, Kelsey? Awesome. Thanks, Brent. So hi, everyone. Um, as Brent said, my name is Kelsey Jones. I am the executive editor at Search Engine Journal. I have about seven years of marketing and PR experience, um, 11 years in journalism and editing, and my main uh, responsibility at SCJ is that I drive our entire content strategy in order to drive traffic and increase community engagement. And I also want to add, I have my retro shirt on for the event Star Wars, so I'm a huge Star Wars fan. That's probably my favorite blast from the past. So Brent, take the, the, the fun thing with Star Wars is they've reinvented everything so much, so it's like blast from the past for some, and it's like, oh, that's last week for some others, right? <laughs> um, yes, pretty. that's true. Though any movie that has Jar Jar Binks in it, I'm not counting as a Star Wars movie, so... True. I don't think he, I, th I think they said something about killing him off in this next one. But anyway. Okay. Good. We'll, good. We'll get <laughs> so housekeeping items. If during the webinar you have any questions, comments, experiences, tidbits you want to add, anything that would be considered appropriate um, to, to type out and put online, um, you definitely can um, participate with this webinar by using the hashtag on Twitter, S E J Think Tank. Um, you can see it in the presentation throughout uh, at the bottom of the slides. Um, and you can also use the question box within the webinar itself. Um, throughout the uh, presentation, we're going to have a number of poll questions. This is your opportunity to participate. Give us your feedback. Give us your opinion. Answer the questions um, and, and get involved. Um, we're going to do our best throughout the presentation if there's mention to tools or various different resources to put the links within the webinar um, chat itself and also on um, Twitter. Um, but if we miss something, just let us know and we'll make sure we get that link out there. The entire webinar, all the links, all the questions, literally everything is going to end up um, being recapped and summarized so that, um, and, and then published on SCJ uh, in the next couple of days. I, I think we've gotten pretty quick about it, so it might be within the next day. Um, so. Everything's going to be there for you. You can recap, you can share it with others, you can get all the information you need from that. Um, but without any further ado, let's jump into uh, talking about nostalgia and marketing. Kelsey. Awesome. Thanks, Brent. So today we're just going to cover basically a primer on what is nostalgia marketing. Sometimes people call it retro marketing. Um, I think nostalgia marketing is kind of more of an accurate term. And then I, I'm going to break it down a little bit into building that nostalgic, um, nostalgic concepts into your content marketing and also your social media. So first, just a little primer on what is nostalgia marketing if you haven't heard of it or really used it before. So um, basically, it is using themes or products or ideas from the past in your current marketing now. So that might be posting things that happened um, previously and it kind of creates a sense of emotion and people recalling where they were at that time and it just um, generates kind of a unique emotional feeling that most people can't get anywhere else. Um, it also involves maybe using retro themes in your current products so I'll talk about that with a few examples later but just kind of you know new products that have a kickback or throwback feel to them, that also ties into nostalgia marketing as well. So I also wanted to talk a little bit about why nostalgia is so appealing to people and why it works so well. The reason why adults feel such a really good connection to their teenage years is because our brains on a scientific level were actually still developing during then. So we felt emotions at a stronger level when we were teenagers versus adults. So that's why the emotional connection to what happened when we were teenagers is so much more felt even now as an adult. I also think too that nostalgia is so appealing because when you were a kid, you really didn't have any responsibilities. I didn't have a job till I was 16, so I would spend summers 
going to the pool, hanging out with my friends, and sometimes when you're an adult and life gets in the way and it's so busy crazy, you think about, or at least I do, those awesome summers where you didn't have to do anything and worry about a mortgage or making sure the whole house was clean or things like that. Those are things your parents usually worried about. Um, I also think nostalgia um, can be triggered during life transitions, which has also been scientifically proven. So if somebody's moving to a different city, if they get married, when they have kids, those huge transitions, um, graduating high school, moving to college, those also trigger a sense of nostalgia as well. So if your target market is going to be going through those transitions, nostalgia is an even more powerful marketing strategy for you. Nostalgia has also been shown um, to be a coping mechanism whenever you're stressed. So if you feel lonely or stressed, people will go back to the times in their life where they felt happy, and it gives them a sense of comfort and calm. Um, and a really in cool study I read about was that um, study participants, when they listened to their favorite songs from 20 years ago, they had a sense of that they felt more loved and felt a better sense of belonging because those songs from 20 years ago triggered an important emotional connection in them. So nostalgia is a really powerful emotional pull that you could use to connect with your audience. I also wanted to talk a little bit about um, brands that are using nostalgia marketing today. It's a really popular thing. So oh, um, two good examples are Pepsi and Nike. Nike. Um, so Nike releases retro versions of their sneakers almost every year and they become a collector's item. So they're going to be styles that were cool in like the 70s, 80s, 90s and now they're being re-released. So they're brand new sneakers but they have that retro throwback and people love that. Um, similarly, Nike or sorry, Pepsi released um, soda that has real sugar and the original recipes from you know the 60s, 70s, 80s, and they labeled it a throwback series. And um, Coke has done that as well and used real sugar in their recipes. So those have been proven to be so popular that they've even expanded it to their other soda flavors like Mountain Dew or Sprite using um, original packaging mascots, things like that. So it really has been shown to be a powerful product development and marketing tool as well. So one thing that I really want to impress upon you guys um, as to why nostalgia marketing is such a powerful tool is because your audience is looking for that blast from the past solely because of those reasons I just discussed. Um, they want to feel happy, loved, like they're a part of something, especially in times of stress. So it's storming, so if you hear the thunder, sorry about that. Um, so I wanted to mention right now the 90s are back in, and huge in fashion, marketing, music, people um, are really loving the 90s, especially if that's when they grew up. So if you're looking for um, a nostalgic campaign that would get a lot of traction right now, anything from the 90s has a really big pull right now. Um, and I included a photo of the Spice Girls because they were my jam in the 90s. Um, I want to say if you're looking for the right uh, decade to target, you should choose um, a time of when your target audience was ages 6 to 16. That 10 year time span is usually when people are most nostalgic because it was their childhood to their teenage years. So that's kind of an easy indicator to figure out what, you, what era you should be targeting. One other really cool example that I wanted to share about a successful um, marketing campaign that was based on nostalgia and actually driven by a products community was Surge. So Surge was this really popular soda, I think in the 90s and maybe the early 2000s, that um, Coke released. And it was basically Mountain Dew on steroids, and it was delicious and gross at the same time, but they stopped making it. So the community of Surge drinkers still remembers that soda, even though it was tw you know 20 years ago. They actually, a bunch of people created an Indiegogo campaign to buy a $4,000 billboard um, near Coke's headquarters in Atlanta, and it worked. Because Coke saw that the community wanted that blast from the past, they brought back Surge exclusively on Amazon, and they sell it for 35 bucks for a 12-pack, and people are buying it. It has almost five stars on Amazon, so it was a complete success for Coke because they listened to the fact that their audience wanted that nostalgic feeling in their product. And that brings us to the first poll. So, Brent, do you want to go over the poll? So, first off, real quick, before we jump into the poll, um, for me, it was actually Jolt Cola. I don't know if people remember Jolt, ah, but yeah. Jolt was interesting because when you opened it and looked down inside, it looked like oil on top. 
because it had the little like the rainbow of colors floating on there. So you knew you were about to drink something that was probably not exactly good for you. But it makes a good point is that um, sometimes with nostalgia, um, you definitely want to get the right era. But another thing to consider is what was actually nostalgic for the majority of people in an era. Uh, and, and in yeah. your audience, because sometimes people's personal connections might not be the same as that everybody else's. So a little research probably helps people to find that out. So first poll question, have you ever used nostalgia themes in your marketing? Yes, no, no, but we want to. And let me throw up the uh, the poll question so that you can actually vote on it um, instead of just reading it off the slide. I'll give everybody probably about, you know, another 20 or 30 seconds just to kind of get in there and make their vote. Um, it's not super complicated one. Yes, no, no, but I want to. Um, you know, have you ever used nostalgia in your marketing before? Um, okay, so I'm going to go ahead and close in a couple seconds for any last minute straggling votes. Um, so, you know, as you can see, uh, there's there's um, there's a small, you know, maybe one third of people have actually used nostalgia in their marketing um, and uh, about a quarter of people have no intention to ever do so, uh, which <laughs> is interesting. But. Yeah, it looks like it's pretty split between a third said yes and a third said no, but they want to, which makes sense for why you're in the webinar. Right. So um, hopefully some of the stuff we go over today can help you guys. So moving on, kind of drilling um, further down into how you can actually use nostalgia in your marketing, I wanted to talk a little bit about nostalgia and content and how you can use that. So um, incorporating this um, into your content can help you increase engagement and social sharing. Again, it's going to help you forge that emotional connection with your audience through your blog or any other content platforms you have. And then also if you have a really um, long-standing um, company that has a long history, a rich history, you could also showcase that and that is um, would be tied into nostalgia marketing. So one company that does a really good job of this is Ford um, because they've been around you know for over a century. They do a lot of throwback campaigns, they do a lot of events with their old cars and that's just giving people that feeling of oh I remember riding in you know my dad's you know 19 whatever Ford Galaxy or whatever. So that's a really cool way to um, bring nostalgia into your marketing is to dig into your company archives, which I'm going to give some examples of a little bit later. So one really good um, and popular content platform that I wanted to talk about today was BuzzFeed. So the way that BuzzFeed mainly generates income is that they have brand publishing partners. So these brand publishers will collaborate with the BuzzFeed team on creating branded content pieces. So these pieces are blog posts, just like a non-branded organic post would be on BuzzFeed's site, but it's really targeted to a specific uh, niche that the brand publisher is going after. So in this example, um, the title was 14 Things Everyone Who Grew Up in Canada Will Remember. So even though BuzzFeed gets, I think it's 200 million unique views a month, probably a small sliver of that is people who grew up in Canada or who live in Canada now, but that's who the targeter or the brand publisher wanted to target, which in this case is McCain Deep and Delicious Cakes. So the article went through um, several examples of really specific things that only happen in Canada. Um, so one example here is the Toonie, which is the um, I think it's the $2 coin for Canada. I'm not from Canada, so I think that's just the slang term for the $2 coin. So um, that just kind of started fairly recently, and so that's something that many people in their childhood would probably remember because it was created while they were growing up. And after the different, um, you know, how you can find out or how you only know you're from Canada, after they went through a couple examples, then at the end of the post, of course, uh, the, the brand publisher, McCain Deep and Delicious Cakes, um, included themselves as their last reason. And because it's a kind of a long-standing brand that has a history in Canada, that totally fit in with the article. And so um, we had to look up what McCain Deep and Delicious Cakes were because all of us on our team didn't know what it was. And it turns out there's the, there are these really thick cakes that are already made so you can do you know, cookies and cream or chocolate or whatever and you just buy them. And so they have this really rich feeling that I think kind of ties back to the theme of nostalgia nicely. Another really good example is Bustle. So Bustle does a lot of organic content um, 
with a nostalgia tie-in for their target audience, which is mainly millennials and a little bit of Generation Z, which is anyone under 21 right now. So they're a women's lifestyle site. They also do um, fashion, beauty tips, entertainment, pop culture. So in this article, um, the title was 10 Summer Songs from the 90s That Will Make You Totally Nostalgic. So this is right up my alley, of course. You know, I grew up in the 90s, so of course I read the article. And one thing that they did really well is they didn't just list the art, the songs and then just leave it at that. They actually embedded the music videos for each of the songs, um, which is from YouTube, which is super easy to do. But it really worked because then, like, let's say I had forgotten about TLC's Waterfalls, which I don't know who would forget about that, but let's say I did. Well, if the music video is right in the post, I can be like, oh, awesome. I forgot about that song. I want to play it. So that's increasing time on site because I'm going to be listening to all these music videos now um, directly from the blog post because the video is embedded and it's not taking me to YouTube. So, you know, if they have a related post widget at the bottom that linked to other nostalgic content, that'd be a really cool way for them to keep users on site because they're drawn by that nostalgic feeling, uh, especially if they're looking for a break in their work day. Um, nostalgic content is usually something that should be fun, um, should be, you know, create a sense of history and community. And so I think Bustle did a really good job with this example. One of the cool things uh, also, you know, we had talked about before as well is that, you know, a lot of people do collaborative polls of nostalgia uh, content, but you can also apply almost all these nostalgic themes to your own content, right? The music, when you're actually creating content, you can apply it um, quite well. But one of the, the one of the things I think people really need to grab onto is everybody's bought into the idea of current events, right? It's like, oh, mm -hmm. Game of Thrones is out. We have to make a ton of content about Game of Thrones. Um, the thing is, is the emotional connection with nostalgic content is the same as current events right so if you if you if you're you know connecting to something like this people are going to share it a ton they're going to link to it they're going to talk about it they're going to especially share it with specific friends who they know are going to like that content similar to how current events would work with like a game of thrones type thing but the difference is, is competitive nature when you're creating nostalgic content you're not competing with anybody else um so you get the entire limelight uh, for that initial effort, where when you're doing current events, you're competing with hundreds of other people. Um, so, you know, kind of leads us to our, our, our second poll, um, which is, you know, do you think nostalgic content is effective? Um, simple, simple questions, simple answers, yes, no, or it depends on the industry. Um, do you think that nostalgic content is effective? Um, and we'll leave this up for another, you know, 20 seconds or so just to give people a chance to, to, to cast their vote and to think about it. Um, and then we'll uh, post the results and see what, what people are thinking. Awesome. Yeah, I'm really curious to see the answers on this one. Right. I think it could work for almost any industry. It just depends on what you're creating. Yeah, I would agree most most on any content creation, right? Just doing social yeah. media, we've seen that, you know, um, you can come up with, uh, I've seen companies do fun stuff for a company that made screws where they were like, you know, how to screw things, right? You know, how to screw up projects, how to, you know, they did a whole thing on screws. Um, so, I, I, you know, I, there's a lot of fun stuff you can do. So there was a company, a urinal company that did one of the biggest social uh, promotions, uh, got millions of, you know, visits and, and, and doing different unique ur urinals from around the world. So, uh, so yeah, let's awesome. go ahead and uh, share the results on that. Um, well, you know, I, I think that it's pretty clear that people definitely think it's effective in one way or another. Um, yeah. Pretty yeah. split with, with the, whether it depends on the industry or not, but still, you know, very effective. Yes. Awesome. Yeah. Good to know. So let's move on to nostalgia and social media and how you can use um, these themes in your social media strategies. So um, first, I kind of Brent kind of lightly touched on this, but nostalgia can be used for new content as well as sharing old content. So you know, in addition to sharing old images, which I'm going to give examples um, a little bit later in this section, you can also use that nostalgic feeling to create new content. So um, you know, let's say if you did a music video that was industry specific, but you did it in the style of 1940s jazz or something like that, that'd be tying nostalgia into new content. 
Um, or if you did um, an infographic on, like Brent said, if you did, if you were a urinal company, um, urinals in the history, that'd kind of be a combination of creating new. So you're creating the infographic with the history, but then you're also tying in the past. So think of not only resharing what's already happened in the past, but also how you can create that spin for your new content as well. Um, if you are looking for different things to share, I would recommend your old company archives, um, past industry videos, maybe on YouTube. If there was this really epic training video that your company had in the 80s with like awesome 80s fashions, maybe you could not only share that, but if you wanted to create new content, you could then recreate it and do um, everybody would be an 80s style and kind of update it. Um, with the new, you know, safety guidelines, but it's a throwback to the original video. That'd be something really cool and way more interesting than just a traditional safety video. Uh, another point I really wanted to touch on is when it comes to social media specifically, photos should always be the main focus, photos and video. Um, it's been proven in lots of studies that photos and video posts on any social media platform usually get a lot more clicks and engagement than just text-based posts. And obviously with, with nostalgia, you're going to be sharing that type of media anyway, so it works out. So I wanted to go over a couple examples that I've seen of really good social media um, nostalgia marketing campaigns. So the first one, going back to combing the company archives, the New York Times actually has a Twitter account and a separate subdomain on their website for their archives. So they will look through current events that are happening now in the country or even New York City um, in particular and create an archive post about it. So in this example, um, it last month and in April, most um, juniors and seniors in high school in the U.S. were going to prom. So they did a whole article on what prom was like in the 70s. They had photos from actual coverage that they did. Um, they did a whole kind of time machine post on what the trends were, what people wore, what they did before and after, the activities. And it's just really cool to see that the New York Times covered that and to see, you know, what prom was like back then versus now. So it kind of has that tie-in into um, current events, which is what Brennan mentioned earlier as well. Another role for creating that new new content is if you're creating industry events, you should um, see if you can kind of build a nostalgic theme into it. So Kansas City, which is where I live, they have a really rich history with our baseball team. We have the Royals now, so they were in the World Series last year. So the Royals, they're always popular in Kansas City, but even now people love going to the games, having fun, things like that. So one thing that they did at the start of this season is the Royals held a throwback night to one of the former um, baseball teams that were in Kansas City called the Monarchs. And so they said, hey, we're doing this retro theme to honor the Monarchs team, um, dress as, um, you know, as people did in that period, which I believe was the 30s and 40s. So as you can see on this photo, which was taken at the stadium, um, a couple of friends just went, you know, dressed up as their favorite outfits from the 30s and 40s and had their photo taken with an impersonator at the event. And then that was shared on Twitter with the unique hashtag that the Royals had come up with um, for that specific night. And that is just a wealth of content that um, people are going to be sharing online that then you can capture and reshare on your own social media channels. You could do a roundup post, you know, here's our favorite photos from our throwback night at the stadium or, you know, at our office or whatever. That's a really cool way to kind of crowdsource content is if you do a nostalgic event and then just ask people to share with a unique hashtag so it's really easy to track. Um, and this was another thing, you know, I, talk, I talked about a little bit earlier. So create your own content. So this could be infographics um, that you're then sharing on social. You could do little, you know, meme-worthy images. So in this example, it brings back, you know, back in the day when email first started 10 years ago, you were excited to get an email. You thought it was awesome. Now you're probably sick of getting email. It just comes and comes, at least for me and you love getting um, you know, a card in the mail that makes your day. So this type of feeling of comparing the past versus the present and how we feel back then versus now has a really strong pull when it comes to social media and the images you're posting. Um, here's another example of an infographic that was created. So 
um, this company, HostGator, they did a article or sorry, an infographic about what kids did in the past versus the internet generation. So, you know, baby boomers and Generation X, they didn't have the internet. So what they do for fun, how they how did they grow up versus now? What how are our children using the internet and technology to shape what they do with their everyday school, you know, fun events, social events, how they communicate. And so it's a really cool um, way again to compare the past to the present, but in a new type of content. And that brings us to our third poll question. I don't know if Brent is here. Brent? I'm here. Sorry about that. Just uh, had it on mute and forgot. So um, third poll, last poll we're going to do. Um, qu quick question for you. Does nostalgia marketing work better for content or social media? Um, very opinion-based question, but one I'm very interested to see what people respond with. So I'm going to toss up the actual poll, uh, give everyone about 30 seconds or so. Um, you know that that one picture you had a minute ago with the uh, the emails thing. When I first saw that, I split, uh, you know, I split laughing hard. That was so funny because it's so true. Like back yeah, in the day, so you get, you know, I, I was back in the AOL days, so it was like you've got mail, you know, and it was like, ooh, what did I got, you know, and then like now it's like 300 mails, jeez. You know? Um, I know it gets exhausting having to keep up with it. So uh, our poll do, does nostalgia marketing work better for content or social media? Content, social media, or both? We're gonna go ahead and close this out and share the results. Um, you know, a small fraction for content, you know, a, a chunk for social media and a lot saying for both. And I, I would agree that it works really well for both. Um, it works, you know, across the board, uh, in my opinion, uh, quite well. Yeah, and you can also, you know, cross-reference between the two. You know, if you create images for a blog post, then, of course, that would be great to share on social. So it's really easy to, um, you know, utilize both in an overall nostalgic marketing campaign. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, since we went through content marketing and social media, I wanted to kind of go through some overall do's and don'ts when it comes to nostalgia marketing. So one really important thing I want to stress is that nostalgic content is best created by people who lived in the decade that you're creating about, um, creating the content about, or lived in, you know, the country if it was like our BuzzFeed Canada example um, versus an American. So in the BuzzFeed example, I couldn't have written that article because I didn't grow up in Canada. So there's little things, um, you know, about the Toonie that maybe I just wouldn't have thought of. Um, likewise, you know, since I'm a millennial, it wouldn't make sense for me to do, you know, a retro throwback post about the 30s, you know, 20 awesome toys from the 30s. I mean, I could do some research and come up with, a few, you know, maybe 10, but it'd be so much easier for someone who grew up during that time to be able to um, talk about it. So I would recommend, you know, at least having input from people who grew up in the time period that you're trying to create content around. Um, if you don't know really where to get started, I recommend utilizing current events, holidays, uh, trends in order to kind of provide a jumping off board when it comes to the content creation. So. A really good example is if you wanted to do something about Christmas, um, again, you could say, you know, 15 um, amazing toys we missed from the 90s that you wanted, you always wanted to get at Christmas. That's kind of a long title, but you know where I'm going with this. So you could do, you know, 15 toys that were really, really popular in the 90s that they don't make anymore that, you know, kids were always want, wanting in their, um, you know, in their stockings in the morning. Or something like. I know for my brother. Something like uh, Christmas commercials then and now, right? You can do a lot of then and now. Exactly. Too, yeah. Yeah, and I was going to say for my brother, um, he always wanted Tickle Me Elmo. That was like huge in the 90s. So just little like cool toys that maybe um, people wouldn't have remembered unless you reminded them. Um, and tie that into what's happening now. Oh, and you could totally, just, thing, just on that one right there, you could totally run with that and be like uh, the toys that you couldn't get. Like all the Christmas toys you couldn't yep, get. Yeah, they were always sold out. Tickle Me Elmo was always sold out. It drove my man, my mom nuts. So, um, And again, you know, consider your audience. Create content that um, they'll like from when they're in elementary school up to high school. So again, ages 6 to 16 is kind of the sweet spot when it comes to figuring out what decade you want to focus on. Um, a couple don'ts. So when it comes to nostalgic content and social media, 
um, you want to make sure it fits your niche or else it's going to seem like newsjacking. Newsjacking is basically when brands take something that's trending on social media or a trending hashtag and try to tie in their products to it and it's blown up in so many companies faces that's probably a whole other webinar but basically um, even though we know nostalgia marketing works fairly well it has to be specific to your niche and your industry or else it's just going to come off as like cheesy and that you're trying too hard um, and again it also needs to be unique to your company so just because something you know works for your audience and it's been on BuzzFeed then that doesn't mean you should copy it and it would work for you um, and your company. So try to be really specific. Try to think of ways that um, you can position the content where it's unique to your company and what you provide versus what's worked for everyone else in the past. And then finally, uh, I wanted to wrap up with a little, um, a few more key takeaways. So nostalgia makes your audience want to connect with you. It takes them back to less stressful times in their life where they were happy, and they had their friends, you know, down the block playing with their favorite toys. So it gives that connection because you, as the publisher and your audience, um, they both, you're both saying that you grew up in that time period. So it's just something you have in common with your um, consumers, your audience, that then you can share and talk about together. And that takes me to my second point. Nostalgia and content is a great way to drive traffic and engagement. So you're going to see a lot more um, people likely in the comments or in social media replying saying, oh my god, I remember Tickle Me Elmo, I loved it so much, it was awesome, or, you know, Tickle Me Elmo sucked, the voice box failed, and it sounded like it was the devil, which is the true thing that happened. Um, so it's just going to have people come up and want to share their own experiences with your content, and that's just an awesome way to engage them. And when you do engage, make sure um, it's not salesy like oh well you like tickle me Elmo you should try our you know teddy bear that talks too we have it now I mean there's a, a difference between trying too hard and trying to slip your brand in whenever you can and just making it a natural part of the conversation like uh, McCain deep and delicious cakes did with the BuzzFeed example and then finally that kind of ties it all together um, don't make your nostalgia cheesy or make it seem like you're trying too hard or trying to be cool because people pick up on that. Um, because nostalgia is so precious to all of us, um, you want to take it as precious too. And so you want it to be genuine content that people can just reminisce about together and have a laugh about versus taking advantage of that feeling. So I just caution you to be careful as well. And that's all I have. So thank you so much for um, taking this trip down memory road with me. Um, if you want to talk to me uh, later, there's my social media profiles. I'm always happy to answer questions. If you um, want to ask anything later, you can always use the SCJ Think Tank hashtag as well. Awesome. Thank you uh, for the great information. I think, you know, I think nostalgia is one of those things that, you know, uh, I, I kind of forgot about for a while, you know, really utilizing. Um, you see it and you recognize it, but to really think about it as a part of the marketing plan. Um, and it, it, I think the biggest touch on that, the final bit was the, the engagement. You know, I mean, that's the biggest factor right now in most of the algos and most of the uh, success metrics, you know, with social media is that engagement level. And I think um, it's, it's tough to get people to interact even on current events, but it's, it's, it's very easy to get that interaction with nostalgia. So I, I think it's a, a good point for everybody to really take away that, you know, this is something that they can all do and it's something they all should be doing. Um, you know, speaking of great information as well, um, you know, I, I want to take this moment to plug our next webinar. We have a, a really interesting uh, webinar coming up next uh, by John Ball. And he's going to be talking about the value of link building and online marketing. I mean, look, link building has come, you know, a long way with discussions and, and different elements of it. And if you're wondering today, you know, what should I still be doing? What's still effective? You know, what's, you know, bad? What's good? John Ball is going to come on and, and really break all that down for us. Uh, uh, it's going to be on June 17th, same time, 1 p.m. Eastern time. Um, definitely worth checking out. Um, we have a bit of information, uh, a bit of time left, and so we want to jump into a, a little bit of Q&A. Um, 
I want to just remind everybody that we are using uh, the hashtag SEJ Think Tank. You can post the questions in the webinar or on Twitter. Um, we're going to use the time that we have to answer them. Any of the questions we don't get to, we're still going to answer afterwards. So please throw up any questions that you have for this. Um, and jumping into that, let's look at our first question, an interesting one. Um, this is from Greg, who wanted to ask, what would you say is the most challenging is issues you found using nostalgia marketing? If, if you have any, if there are any? Um, I think it goes back to um, marketers wanting to take advantage of it. So I think as marketers, we naturally want to squeeze the juice out of everything we can. And again, like I said, I think because nostalgia has such like this sparkly, warm, fuzzy feeling associated with it, you have to be really careful to not overdo it. Um, or make it seem too disingenuous. So let's say if you had a company, if you had the screw company, like Brent said, it wouldn't make sense to have a blog post on your article, or sorry, a blog post on your blog um, that was, you know, 90s music videos that rocked out. Like that's not, that's not tying it into um, what you sell, which is screws. So keeping it as closely um, related as possible to your industry and what you provide um, is, a, is a struggle I see many companies going through. Um, and so I think that that's probably the biggest challenge is just coming up with the best way to tie it into your industry, especially if you don't have something relatively easy to tie into, like fashion would be something so easy to use nostalgia marketing for. Um, if your industry is something you know more B2B or more industrial, it's a little bit harder to create that content. Yeah, and, I, and I, I, that would be my exact answer is, is the same. The only thing I would say to kind of challenge, you know, uh, to solve that challenge of, you know, even with the screw company, you could go back and find like maybe a Seinfeld or something has a bunch of scenes where they're, you know, doing some construction or there was that one show back in the day, remember Home Improvement? With such a with Tim, yeah, Allen. Full time. Like you could find a ton of things with them doing yeah. screws and stuff like that. So they could put a whole skit together about screws with uh, you know home improvement, tie it back to doing actual home improvement with the screws. It would be you know so regardless of the industry, it's just being creative. And I think you know that, that that's the biggest challenge. Yeah. Yeah. Good call. Good Next idea. question um, uh, from Janelle. What do you think about Throwback Thursdays, classic TBT. I think it's awesome. I think it's a really cool way to create a quick nostalgic, you know, piece of nostalgic content that ties in with something that's usually trending, which is, you know, the hashtag TBT. Um, again, you don't want to news jack jacket and be like, oh, TBT to our post last week. That's not really what Throwback Thursday was meant for or Flashback Friday along the same lines, um, you want to take it back to as far as you can. So, you know, no matter your industry, you, again, could go through your company's archives and say, you know, flashback Friday to our first ever staff meeting at, you know, I don't know, Red Curtain Marketing Group. And it is, you know, people in their totally, like, 90s, you know, or 80s um, shoulder pads, you know, meeting at this conference table. That's something that's totally a really um, awesome Flashback Friday or Throwback Thursday, and it ties into your company's history, and it's not seeming like you're trying to newsjack the, the hashtag for that day. Yeah, and I would further just add to the, you know, not overdoing it. You know, people, they get into this, and they're like, every Thursday, I've got to have a Throwback Thursday, right? It's like every Thursday, yeah. right? You don't have to. Any, any type of content that you're doing, you want to – sparse it out and you want to make sure you're not overusing it. So, you know, I would really recommend not trying to do it every Thursday um, and just throw it in there when you really have something worth putting in. Exactly. And that goes the same for nostalgia content in general. I mean, you don't want every post on your blog or your Facebook page to be nostalgic. You just want, this is just a strategy that you can mix in with everything else you're already doing. Absolutely. From Tara, um, how can you blog or create, we'll say, create uh, nostalgic marketing campaigns without violating uh, their IP, the intellectual pro property, the, the, the copyright elements? How do you do this without getting in trouble for it, essentially? So if you're wanting to share content that doesn't belong to your company, 
I recommend going the Creative Commons route. So uh, Wikimedia Commons, which is sort of the image library arm of Wikipedia, all of their images are Creative Commons um, licensed, which means you can use it in an editorial um, viewpoint. So, so you'll have to check, and Creative Commons is a whole other, you know, again, probably a whole other webinar, but um, there's two types. There's editorial and promotional. So um, make sure that you're not using it at any content that they say is only for editorial. Um, make sure you use it for the right purpose, but anything that's flagged as Creative Commons um, is a good way to find content. So Wikimedia Commons, like I said, um, Photopin is another good Creative Commons search engine. Um, Pixabay is also um, a free image site that I have had good luck with that is Creative Commons licensed. Um, another thing that we've also done at SEJ is if somebody is sharing content from another website or company um, or if they want to share it, we just ask the company if we can use it. We'll say, you know, hey, you have this really awesome photo. Um, can we just share it on our site? This is what the, the post is about that we're sharing it in. And you'd be surprised at how many people are okay with it as long as you link back to the source. So um, even just asking, you'd be surprised um, again, how many people just say that's fine? So two things that I would say. One, I think that if you're a company that's really doing serious marketing and you're going to go through this, there's a lot of um, legal, internet legal companies out there today. It's a, it's a whole practice that's kind of opened up. I can't imagine it would cost more than a couple hundred dollars to have a two hour or one hour conversation with some of these people and just simply ask them the question of like, this is our industry. This is what we're trying to do. What's our legal ramifications? Um, what you'll find is that there's fan art, so you can illustrate or recreate. Um, so if you're taking nostalgia themes, you can run with them pretty openly. The real problem is with copyright is when you're trying to pass off something as your own. Like, I, this is my thing, yeah. right? Not so much when you're doing something that's fan related. So if you're taking a, a theme and making a video, if you're recreating some graphics, there's a lot of people that, that falls underneath the fan art creation. Um, but, you know, there, there's there's some legal stuff there as well as when a, when a brand has public, you know, um, things like YouTube videos, you can grab them off YouTube. Yeah. YouTube kind of protects you from that because that's YouTube's responsibility. Right. Uh, same thing for music, exactly. those other areas. So um, it's really, you know, I would really recommend taking an hour and talking to a legal company about this and really set yourself up for the next five years of feeling comfortable. But beyond that, there's a lot of options for you. There's also, uh, I don't remember the cutoff. It's a rolling deadline. I want to say it's about 100. Any content created over 100 years ago is free to use. And I don't know the exact specifics. It's an estimate, so you'd have to check. But, like, so um, Lewis Carroll's original artwork from Alice in Wonderland, anyone can use that now because I think it was created in the late 1800s. And so if you're going to kick it back, Far and you want to use original artwork from, you know, books or newspapers, and it's it was in the 1800s or I think early 1900s. Sometimes that is um, anyone can use that. Um, Sherlock Holmes, all those story stories are now um, what's the word? It's like open source or open property. Um, anyone can use those stories and reformat them and rework them. So that's another cool idea to find content as well that there isn't really any legal restrictions but again you'd have to check on the cutoff date I don't remember what it is yeah good point so here's an interesting comment uh, from Bev she you know first off she says nice job you're doing you know a great webinar um, but she has a thought she says she's 50 and while she romances her teen years, as a parent, she was responding even more to the years of her children, right? Um, you know, the, 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 the next generation moments that she still remembers. Same thing as me, as I remember these kids shows and these kids songs, like they're in my head still for my, my kids, right? So yeah. I, I, what is your thoughts about, um, you know, involving both, you know, your own personal experiences and potentially your children's experiences? Well, I think you should definitely look in, that's probably like parenting nostalgia or something like that because you then have nostalgia over again because you're basically reliving a childhood and teenage year period through your child. 
Um, and so if you if your company was um, sold things to children or um, marketed to teens or whatever, then it would make sense to target the parents of those teens as well um, based on the nostalgia that they may, may have for when their kids were growing up. Um, so I would say it definitely would probably work best if you're trying to target parents um, to take that angle of maybe the second wave of nostalgia. Um, I will say too, you know, kind of broadening that sort of idea, you can also, you know, write content about nostalgia from when people had a huge event in their life. So, you know, I bought my first house, um, I think it was four years ago this month. So, you know, an article that says, you know, 20 things you didn't know until you bought your first house, that's going to trigger nostalgia in me because I'm going to say, oh, I remember when I bought my first house and I had no idea, you know, I had to pay PMI or all this stuff. Um, that's kind of taking advantage of that second wave of nostalgia because I'm remembering um, a big event in my life and kind of reliving it again. So if you want to branch out, you know, beyond people's child, um, childhood and teen years or their kids' teen years or childhood, you could also think about life events and recall those times as well. Yeah, I would say, you know, Bev, really good point. Um, it's a great additional kind of demographic add-on that's like, hey, don't forget, you can also, you know, target, yeah. the, you know, different groups. So I think it's a really good point. The thought I have is just simply, it's a really good point. Um, it's something people should definitely consider. Um, yeah, exactly. Uh, Checking that maybe we got time for more. I'm going to go ahead and give us one more and then I'll get word on how much more time we have. Um, any stories about fails? Anything that could be used as an example that people could look up and say, this is a really bad example um, of using nostalgia, something to, to showcase as to avoid? Oh, geez. Um, I'm trying to think. Um, I can't think of any specific examples, but I the first thing that comes to mind is if something was, if the practice was stopped back in the day, then maybe there was a reason. So, um, you know, I don't know, like, like if they stopped making a toy, you should make sure that they didn't stop making it because it was real because children died from ingesting the stuffing of this bear or, or something. Or they're you also want to make sure. Into, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say, you know, the main issues, feminism, you know, uh, race yep. issues, uh, any of the things that could be tied back to a time period you always have to be careful of. But I mean, really the biggest fail is when people don't think things through. Um, you know, they don't think these things through, they don't look at the potential negatives and then they don't, you know, do a quality campaign and then they kind of get, you know, um, kind of slammed for that. So, but I think that has to do with, um, just about all of your marketing campaigns in general is you have to be aware of, uh, the negative, negative stigmas that apply to those topics. Exactly. Like one example I keep thinking of is, um, there was a soda, I think in the eighties called AIDS, A-Y-D-S. And obviously that was discontinued because of AIDS, the disease. So you're obviously not going to create a nostalgia campaign about AIDS, the soda, because that's a really hot topic for the sufferers of this actual disease. So it's just kind of being aware of, you know, of what was happening then and what's still happening now. So, um, you know, our country and everybody's country has a history of certain things happening that you know, you probably don't want to bring up again. Like, obviously nobody should be doing nostalgia campaigns about 9-11 or something like that. It's just, like you said, being aware of how people still feel about things, even if they happened 50 years ago or 20 years ago or 10 years ago, you need to have your, you know, thumb on the pulse of how people are going to react to it instead of focusing on, um, oh, that'd be cool to talk about again. You know, we should bring that up. All right. Um, another question. Um, is there a monetary value to nostalgia marketing? Um, I don't, I'm guessing the question's a little strange to me, um, just in the regard of like what it specifically means. The only way I, I could see, you know, that would I, I would answer that would be that there's monetary value to any marketing, depending on if it's driving ROI. 
Um, I think, this, you know, you said it best earlier. Nostalgia marketing is just another element of an overall marketing. It's another strategy that fits into an overall marketing campaign. And an overall marketing campaign should have monetary or a ROI value. And nostalgia should just be one way of getting it out there. Exactly. It's more of a style of content versus um, like obviously PPC is a vertical versus organic search. Like those are verticals that you can track, um, but you could have nostalgic elements in both of those. You know what I mean? So it's more of like a style or a lens through which to create content or post content versus, you know, a different vertical of marketing. Now, that doesn't mean you can't make money on something. I mean, you could definitely probably go out and make nostalgia today, you know, Twitter and Facebook, you know, pages and stuff and start focusing really heavily on nostalgia and doing something like on this day 20 years ago. Um, there's a lot of things you could probably do to build, you know, a monetary system out of it. But, you know, that's any business model you would create, you know, would have. Yeah. Or, I mean, like if you did, if you were like a clothing manufacturer and you did a blog post about um, 15 awesome fanny packs from history. And then you had a link at the bottom that was like, you know, check out our fanny packs as throwbacks, you know. Like you could tie it into products that you offer, you know. And that kind of goes back to the urinal example of, um, you know, you're, you're offering examples of urinals in history. Well, then you could link to the urinals that you offer now, you know, it's kind of tying into what you offer now that fits in naturally with the content that you're creating. Absolutely. So I think we're going to cut there. We, we've, we've run a little over time. Uh, that's okay, but, you know, we'll go ahead and uh, we're going to make sure we have a couple more questions in here. We'll make sure that we get them to Kelsey and we'll get them answered up on Twitter and also in the recap post. Again, you can use the uh, hashtag SCJ Think Tank. Uh, continue asking your questions, even if you have one 30 minutes from now, whatever. Uh, post it. We'll do our best to answer them. And uh, also, please remember, uh, John Ball uh, going to be on uh, June 17th at 1 p.m. Eastern time talking about link building. Definitely going to want to check it out. And uh, thank you very much, Kelsey, for this great presentation on nostalgia. Uh, you know, I, I think that people will really walk away with a lot of good takeaways from this. Awesome. Good. And thank you, Brent. All right, everyone. Thank you. And uh, we'll see you again next time.